Well, thank you for joining us for this uh, second sermon in our series on doubt. You might find it a little odd to follow Easter with a series on doubt. But if you think about it, there's not a single other faith that promises you resurrection from the dead and the forgiveness of sins. The closest we get to that is maybe Hinduism and Buddhism, where you have the promise of reincarnation. Only in Hinduism and Buddhism, when you get reincarnated, you are actually saddled with your sin. So when you come back in your next life, you're saddled with your sin. Your sin determines how you come back, and you don't actually come back as yourself. Christianity alone promises resurrection and the forgiveness of sin. So if you're a thinking person, part of you should be a little bit skeptical after Easter. Because Christianity makes some bold claims. We claim the resurrection from the dead. We claim the forgiveness of sins. We claim the promise of eternal life. We promise friendship with God. We promise rights to be made wrong and the defeat of evil, all on Good Friday, celebrated and confirmed on Easter. That's a tall order for anybody. And if we're honest, if you're a thinking person, you should come after that going, scratching your head and going, am I really sure? Am I really sure that Christianity delivers on all of that? And so it seems to me that it makes sense that following Easter, we would enter into this time thinking about doubt. But you know, the problem with preaching on doubt is that we often use doubt to refer to different things. So for example, you could ask me if Lisa would like to go to this Korean restaurant down the street because they are known for the best tongue in LA. And you ask me, do you think Lisa would like to go? And I'm going to say, I doubt it. You know why I doubt it? because I know my wife does not like to eat tongue. It could be the best cooked tongue in the world and my wife will not like it, right? I doubt that she would like it because I know her preferences. Last year, I had a friend tell me they thought I doubted someone at work. You have doubts about someone at work because you don't trust them. I said, no, actually, I trust that person. I just trust that they're gonna do something in a way I don't like it, right? Those are legitimate uses of the word doubt. But sometimes when we use doubt, we're referring to certainty about something we don't like or disagree with, right? Those are legitimate uses of the word doubt. They just refer to certainty about something I don't like or disagree with. We use doubt sometimes to refer to things we are unsure of. Sometimes we use doubt to refer to uncertainty. Sometimes we use it to refer to skepticism. Sometimes we use it to refer to things we're ignorant of. I don't know, so I have doubts about it. Sometimes we use it to refer to unbelief. Sometimes we use doubt to refer to just an observation that something doesn't quite fit in. It's an astute observation that this one thing doesn't fit with everything else. So for example, if I claim to be a public health expert and I told you, eat ketchup three times a day and you'll never get COVID, you should look at me with doubt and you should think, and you should have doubt about what I just told you because what I'm telling you doesn't fit in with anything you've read or seen about the COVID virus. So, right, so doubt sometimes is an observation that's astute about something that doesn't quite fit in. So one problem with preaching about doubt is that we use the term doubt to refer to different things. But not only that, there are different kinds of doubt. There's rational doubt. Sometimes you doubt something because you think that a fact that is presented to you contradicts another fact or a group of facts that you know. There's ideas, concepts, reasons that you're holding that something that you're told doesn't quite fit with. And so you have doubts based on rational understanding. But at the same time, there's emotional doubt. Sometimes you might doubt something someone says because of how it makes you feel. There's something intuitive that you feel about what you're hearing that makes you doubt what they're saying. Believe it or not, I can say the exact same thing, and depending on how I say it to you, you're going to have a different feeling about it, even though the evidence basis for it doesn't change. Believe it or not, how I tell you something might affect how you believe it. You see, there are times you respond emotively. There's an emotion or an intuition you have about what you're being told or experienced that raises doubt in you, even if the facts don't change. Someone can look at you and smile and say, I really like you. And you're like, mm, I'm not so sure about that. Or they can say, dude, I really like you. You might have doubts about what they're saying, even though the words are the same, because there's something emotive about what's being said, how it's being said, what it's triggering in you. There's emotive doubt. But sometimes there's also spiritual doubt. There could be something that you're absolutely sure of rationally and emotively, but it causes existential crisis for you because it upends the whole way you look at life and think about the world. So you can have rational doubt, you can have emotional doubt, 
you can have spiritual and existential doubt. There's different kinds of doubt. So one of the challenges is that we use doubt to refer to different things. There's different kinds of doubt. And believe it or not, there are different kinds of doubters. Different kinds of doubters. You see, I was raised to be somebody who is a doubter. You see, my dad quoted often, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, test all things, hold fast what is good. And then I went to Pepperdine, where one of the university affirmations is, truth, having nothing to fear from investigation, should be pursued relentlessly. And one of my favorite uh, mantras is, trust but verify. You see, I was raised to doubt. And so I embrace doubt as a part of how I interact with the world. I'm a, I'm a doubter who uses doubt to interact with the world. And in fact, when I hear something that causes me doubt, I get excited. It excites me because it's a new opportunity to learn something new, to prove something, to discover new facts. Uh, as a researcher, I, I do research in science. I love doubts because doubts qu I question what is so that I can discover something new. Doubt triggers something in me that I feel like I have a challenge to overcome. I, face, I experience doubt as something exciting, and I respond to doubt with, a, with challenge as something that I'm going to overcome. Well, this may not surprise you, but my wife... She's a different kind of doubter. You see, when Lisa experiences doubt, her first instinct is not excitement. Hers is generally anxiety and a little bit of fear. When Lisa experiences doubt, her first thing to do is to stop and maybe turn around. You see, when we're diving and I think I see a shark, guess what my first instinct is to do? Well, dude, I want to check it out. I want to see if that's really a shark. And I'm going to beehive it over towards that thing to check it out to see if it really is a shark or not. Meanwhile, my wife, she's going 20 feet the other way because she doesn't want to know if it's a shark. She'll let me find out first. Her first instinct as she experiences doubt is anxiety and uncertainty and caution, whereas mine is excitement and challenge. The way I experience and interact with doubt is I'm going to charge forward and try to overcome it. Hers is going to be to step back and maybe not go forward for a while. See? So one of the problems with preaching on doubt is we can use doubt to refer to different things. There's different kinds of doubt, and there's different ways we experience doubt, and there's different ways we express doubt. Does that make sense? And so it makes it really hard to preach a sermon on doubt that would speak to you without being able to talk to you about what you mean by doubt. How do you experience doubt? What are the kinds of doubt you have? Any, you, we, could, we could preach the best 10, series, 10 sermon series on doubt, which, by the way, this is not 10, ten, uh, um, ten episodes. Uh, and it still might not beat what you're looking for in doubt, because the kind of doubt you have, the, the way you experience doubt and how you express it will be totally different than the way we are. Does that make sense? Well, there's this thing in faith, or theology, called epistemic distance. It's, it's this fancy term that basically says, on one end, you have people who say, there is no God, I know it 100%. And on this end, you have people who say, there is a God, I know it 100%, and I'm absolutely sure. There's two ends, right? 100% I know there is a God, and 100% I know there is no God. Believe it or not, most people are not on the ends. Where are most people? Most people are somewhere in between. Most people are somewhere in between. Even the people who claim to be the most ardent atheists often won't say they know it 100%. And even though there are a lot of people of faith, if you really press them on it, they'll say it's not quite 100% certainty. And so there's this weird phenomenon. You can have someone who's over here. 70% of them believes that there is a God and believes in the Christian story. But 30% of them is uncertain. 30% of them says it doesn't quite work for me. And then on this end, you can have somebody who says 70%, I don't believe there is a God. I don't believe the Christian story. But 30% of me says there's something about it that won't let me just write it off. Do you follow me? Most of us are somewhere on the spectrum. But the crazy thing is, sometimes you can have somebody who says, I believe in Christian faith and believe there's a God 70%. But because of that 30% doubt, they choose to live like an atheist and live as if there is no God. They say, I just can't buy it because of that 30%. On the other hand... You can have somebody who says 70% they don't believe in, in, that there's a God and they doubt the Christian story, but because of 30%, they commit their lives to Jesus, they give it their all and they follow him, even though it's built on 30% faith. Because they just have all those doubts. We, if, if you think about it, 
everybody in this church is somewhere on the spectrum. And in fact, there are people watching at home who are watching because they're not sure where they're at. And one reason why we're preaching this series is because we want you to know that as a church, we want to have an umbrella that covers the entire spectrum of faith. We want you to know that wherever you are on that journey, you have a place with us. That this is a place and a family that wants to walk with you no matter where you are on that spectrum. See, because we, have, we use doubt to refer to different things, because we have different kinds of doubt, because we experience doubt differently, and because we uh, uh, experience doubt differently, we might be anywhere on the spectrum, and that can't always predict what kind of faith or how you will live in life. So as we think about that, I want us to look at a few passages in Scripture. The first one's going to be uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. You'll notice that the Apostle Paul when he's writing to the church in Corinth, this is actually his second letter to them, right? He's writing to them his second letter, and it's supposed to be a very hopeful letter. But even as he's writing to them, he says we're perplexed, but not in despair. Perplexed means you're kind of befuddled. It's that you're scratching your head going, huh? Something's not quite right, and you feel in yourself that something's not all fitting together. That's what happens when you're perplexed. You feel it in your body, your mind. Things just don't fit together, and there's something that sits at e- uh, um, you, You're not at ease. There's something that doesn't sit right with you. That's why uh, some translations say we are confused. Some translations say we are bewildered. Some say we don't know what to do. Other translations say we are sometimes in doubt. When we're per- in perplexed, we don't quite understand. And Paul says we can be in that state and not be in despair. Paul seems to think that doubt is a very present part of life. It's a part of our life of faith. And yet, I know some of you will quote me uh, James chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. See, on the one hand, we hear Paul talking about being perplexed but not in despair. And we understand that Paul sees doubt as a part of the life of faith. But so many of us run into James 1 and we feel so dejected. We feel, I can never ask 100% certainty that God will act, and so then we never ask. But I'm not actually so sure that's what the Apostle James is talking about. If I were to pray that God would help me win the Powerball 8 this week, I should have doubts about whether or not that's in his will. If I am a college student like Noah, and I ask God to give me an A for a test that I didn't study for and for a class I didn't go to, I should have doubts on whether or not it is God's will that I would get an A in that class. If I, if I, if I don't do my work, I don't show up like I'm supposed to, I don't actually do anything that I've been asked by my boss, and I pray that God will help me get a raise, much less keep my job, I should have doubts that God will actually do that. You see, when we pray, when, when, when James says that we ought to pray, the first step of praying without doubt is praying in line with God's will. To pray asking for what God would ask for. To want what God wants. To have his heart. Part of praying the will of God and asking God to intervene is to pray the way God would pray. The second part is trusting that when we ask that way, The God we ask is able to do more than we can ever imagine. That when we ask and pray within the will of God, according to the way God would pray, thinking the way he thinks, asking for what he would want, pursuing what God wants, we can trust that God will make it happen even in ways we may not fully understand. But if you actually go back to James, I don't even think he's talking about petitionary prayer. You see, starting in verse 2, he says this. 
Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. You see, James isn't actually talking about petitionary prayer. So a lot of times Christians and people get caught up, I can't ask because God says to ask without doubt. James isn't even talking about asking about petitionary prayer. He's talking about people who are going through a time of suffering and challenge. And in the process of growing into maturity, he says, ask God for wisdom and to help you grow in maturity. And trust that when you ask God to help you grow in wisdom and maturity, that God will answer your prayer to help you grow in wisdom and maturity. There's a sense of believing that God wants you to grow into the fullness of all that he has in store for you. And so it seems to me that James isn't a good counterpoint to doubt having a role in our life of faith. So I'm going to look at three passages in particular that help us think more deeply about the role of doubt in faith. And I'd like you to walk away with this concept that actually doubt may be one of the most godly tools we have. But before I go on, I have to define doubt, right? Because I said we can use doubt to refer to different things. There's different kinds of doubt. We experience doubt differently, and we express doubt differently. So before I tell you how doubt can be a godly tool, I have to define what I mean by doubt. And this is my definition of doubt. This is the TJV, or Tim Jang version, if you will. Doubt is the motivation to question what I am told, read, or experience for the sake of understanding the truth and will of God better. Let me say that again. Doubt is the motivation to question what I am told, read, or experience for the sake of understanding the truth and will of God better. I'll say that one more time. Doubt is the motivation to question what I am told, read, or experience for the sake of understanding the truth and the will of God better. With that, I'm going to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 starting in verse 19. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. You'll notice that as Paul is encouraging the church in Thessaloniki, he's telling them that they have to test all of the prophetic words, test the things that are preached to them, Test the things that are preached to them. Test the things that they are hearing. Test the things that they are being told about God and faith. He says, test all of them. Hold on to what is good and reject what is evil. As Paul writes to the church in Thessaloniki, he is telling the church, don't just believe. Don't just accept what people tell you, but test them. Have doubt and skepticism about what you're being told. Wrestle with it. Question it. Make sure that it's good. Paul seems to say that part of growing in faith is to have a healthy dose of skepticism, to be uncertain about what you're being told, and to really test whether or not it's any good. So Paul Paul seems to start off with this idea that part of walking a faithful life is to question to have questions, to be a good questioner, to ask questions of the things you're being told, that you're reading, the things that you're experiencing, asking, 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 constantly being on the alert that maybe something you're reading, hearing, or experience is not actually good. But the second thing he says is to reject what is evil and to hold on to what is good. You see, the role of this doubt is to help us determine what's the good we ought to hold on to and to reject the bad that we're not supposed to hold on to. You see, Paul is worried that there are people who will be in the Christian community who will be misleading people through teaching things that are not good. That can happen in terms of, in today's world, through social media, blog posts. It could be books you're reading. It could be people you're listening to. Believe it or not, most people aren't 100% good or 100% bad. Right? If they were all bad, they probably wouldn't be in the church. But you had some people in the church teaching some things that maybe they were sincere but wrong about. 
and there, there are things that were happening, and people were interpreting them a certain way. Paul says, hey, I want you to thrive in your faith. But to thrive in your faith, you have to question the things you're hearing, reading, and experiencing. Question them and see which ones are good or bad. So the first part is that Paul sees that questioning and that doubt as absolutely essential to vibrant faith. But the second part is it's not just the questioning, but it's questioning to the end of finding what is good versus what is bad. Right? He says, hold on to what is good and reject what is evil. We have to interact with things so that we can say, what am I going to take away from this and what am I going to get rid of? What will I reject as evil and what will I hold on to as good? See, one of the problems that we all have, especially with sermon listening, is we often don't listen for what is good and what is evil. We often listen for what we like to hear and what we don't like to hear. Right? You walk away from a sermon, oh, I really liked what he had to say. I did not like what he had to say. But we often don't ask the question is, what's the good and what's the evil? See, it's a lot harder to ask what the good and the evil is because if there's something good or evil, I'm going to have to reject or accept. But if I just like or dislike, what's the big deal? You see, Paul calling us to the kind of doubt that leads to faith says we have to receive what is good and reject what is evil. But this is the, ch- this is the challenge for the cynic. You see, the cynic often cannot believe anything because they have chosen to believe in doubt. The agnostic who often claims the moral high ground, also is one of the most religious people you can know. You see, the agnostic says, I cannot know. That's a religious belief. If you cannot know, how do you know you can't know, first of all? That's that's a slightly contradiction that happens with, with agnostics. But an agnostic says, I cannot know. And therefore, when you try to ask them, what do you think? They'll go, I can't know. I can't know if there's a God. I can't know if Christianity is true. I can't know how to pick a religion. But you see, the problem with the agnostic is they'll never find faith because they've already said they believe you can never know. As soon as the agnostic says, this is how I will know, they no longer become an agnostic because they gave you criteria by which they will know, which means that they believe there is a way to know. So the problem with people who claim to be agnostics is they have a religious belief about knowing, i.e. you can't know, that prevents them from ever knowing. And as soon as the agnostic gives you criteria by which they will know, they no longer become an agnostic because they just gave you criteria by which they can know. And once the agnostic commits to how they will know, you then get to ask, well, is that a good way to know? Moving back to the text, though, however. Paul calls us to be people who will question what we're hearing, reading, and experience for the sake of rejecting what is evil and holding on to what is good. And Paul seems to imply that that's a godly way to live. Moving on, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. The apostle John, writing near the end of his life, writes to the church to encourage them. And one of the things he tells them is to test every spirit. Don't just believe the things you are being told. He says to test them. He says to test every spirit. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. The Apostle John seems like Peter to find a certain amount of skepticism and doubt, uncertainty and questioning to be absolutely vital to the life of faith. I find it ironic. I think in today's world, people say there's too much doubt and skepticism in the church. John seems to be concerned that there wasn't enough doubt or skepticism in the church. You see, today, people say there's too much doubt and skepticism in the church. John seems to be concerned that in the church there wasn't enough doubt and skepticism. You see, when you have doubt about what you're being told and you actually test it, that's going to lead you to either believe it or reject it. You see, when when Trevor preached on the resurrection on Easter Sunday, you were tasked with a decision. You were tasked to test with whether what Trevor said about the resurrection was true 
or false. If it was true, then you're left with the, act, the question, what will I do with it? And if it was false, then you should be looking at all of us and think we're fools. But if you just want to sit back and be like, mm, I didn't really like this part of the sermon, kind of like that part of the sermon, I'm just going to keep sitting here and absorbing it, who cares? You see, the question that John poses to them is one of saying, how will you grow in faith? He wants them to ask questions to test the spirits to see if they're from God. Because if they're from God, then you ought to follow the things they tell you and what is being taught. And if they're not from God, you should reject it. And John doesn't want to give you that easy-peasy, I'm just going to sit here and go with the flow kind of approach to faith. But that's the rub, isn't it? You see, a lot of us like to say we have doubts. And what we really mean is we just don't want to believe. We don't want to have the burden of belief one way or the other. John doesn't want to give us that option. The burden of doubt and the burden of skepticism is, is actually the burden of belief. Because as soon as you have the doubt and the question, you have to answer it and say, is this true or not? And when you ask the question, if it's true or not, that leads you to make some decisions. Here's a question I have for you. When was the last time your doubt led you to do something you didn't want to do? When was the last time your doubt led you to a belief you didn't like? If your doubt and skepticism only reinforces what you already think and believe 100% of the time, I would like to suggest that maybe, instead of being godly doubt, it is a self-serving doubt. That instead of being a doubt and skepticism that would lead you closer to God, your doubt and skepticism has only served to allow you to do you, to be more of yourself and to have more of what you want. John's actually not very interested in that because he tells them to test to see if what they're being told and experiencing is true because he wants them to enter into a relationship with God. And far too often in our world, we use doubt and skepticism as a way of reinforcing what we want to do so that we can keep being ourselves and never have to change. And the biggest fear I have as a pastor and as a Christian is constantly having doubts just reaffirm what I already want to be, believe and think. And so I get to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessaloniki, for they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. In the book of Acts 17, verse 11, Luke tells us that the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians because they received eagerly what was being taught and then they tested what was being taught against Scripture. You see, the people in Berea didn't just say, oh, great miracles, Paul. We'll believe anything you tell us. They didn't say, hey, we heard that you, you, uh, you preached this deep theology and you wrote this great uh, letter to the Romans and to the, to the church in Corinth. We're going to believe everything you say. No, they listened eagerly, and then they tested what Paul said against the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament back then, folks. So they take what Paul says, they read their Old Testament scripture, and they ask, does what Paul say about Jesus line up with the word of prophecy given 800 years prior by Isaiah and Jeremiah and Micah and all the prophets? Does it line up with what was promised by, the, by King David thousands of years before that? Does what was said about Jesus line up with the word of God proclaimed through the centuries? You see, they didn't just believe, and they also didn't just reject. You see, they said, let's figure out if what Paul is saying is true. And they measured the truth of Jesus against a prophetic word that was written eight centuries before sometimes 1,500, almost 2,000 years before. And they looked and say, did God 
in Jesus Christ keep his word? Did God uniquely in Jesus Christ meet over 200 prophecies uniquely? Or did he not? You see, they eagerly listened and they just as eagerly tested. And the Bible tells us that they were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. And so we, when we think about our life of faith, I can't help but think that the motivation to ask questions about what we're told, read, and experience for the sake of understanding the truth and the will of God better can't help but be something that's good for our faith. We see that in the church in Thessalonica. We see that in 1 John. We see that for the Bereans. That as followers of God, we're actually not taught to have easy, easy believism. We're not taught to just believe everything we're told. We're not taught to reject everything we're told either. We're told to test, to ask questions, and to wrestle. To wrestle with the things we don't like. To wrestle with the things we're not sure we can believe. To wrestle with the things that are too easy for us to believe that are so hard for the culture to believe. To wrestle with the things that we don't believe but that the culture does believe. To wrestle with the things that make us different in the world and to ask, are those really the things that God would have make us different in the world? It was such a shame when Martin Luther King Jr. said that the most segregated hour in America was on Sunday morning. And what, what, what he wanted and what would have been great was for the church in that day and age to question, where is this right? And at the same time, when the world says killing millions of unborn babies doesn't matter, the church needs to stand up and say, that's not right. But it, stands, it requires us as Christians not to just be easy believers, but to ask deep questions about what these things mean about human dignity, about being made in the image of God, about what it means to be the people who embrace the call of God in the world. And we've got to constantly be asking questions that will help us grow deeper in our faith. You see, the problem isn't doubt. Doubt and skepticism are asking about questions about things that don't fit right, asking about things that just bother us enough. And, and, and what we do with the doubt and skepticism ought to lead us to Jesus, to better faith. The testing of our faith only makes it stronger. But the problem isn't doubt and skepticism, church. The problem is our motivation for doubt and skepticism. Too many of us use doubt as an excuse not to be faithful. You see, you can come to church here and say, I have my doubts about what this church believes about gender and sexuality. I have my doubts about what this church believes about the right to life and human dignity. I respect all of those doubts and questions people have. The hard part is we have people who say, I have doubts about that. So they keep, but they keep coming to this church, and then they allow their doubt to be the reason why they don't actually do anything at church. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? That doubt's not making you a better follower of Jesus. It's not making you a more faithful follower of God. It's not making you a better member of the church. It's not leading you to do more in the world. All it's doing is allowing you to stay here and be lukewarm, to be neither fully committed or fully involved. Many of us will say we have doubts about the way things have happened in our lives. And I don't mean to make light of our struggle with cancer or the loss of loved ones or trauma that we have faced. But so often we use our doubt about things in our lives as a means to not get involved. And the problem isn't that we have doubts or questions, but it's that instead of working them out with God, we hold on to them and use them as an excuse to be more involved and to serve God more faithfully. The call for each and every one of us as people who care to know truth and to know God is to use doubt and skepticism for the role they were designed to play in our lives. They were designed to keep us safe from believing false things. They were designed to keep us from following wolves rather than a shepherd. They were designed to keep us from doing things we know are wrong when we can be doing the right Isaiah chapter 41 says this in verse 10. 
Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. There's this sense in, in Isaiah's prophecy. This is 41 verse 10. That he talks about a God who would hold us. A God who would be near us. And a God who would be there for us. God does not abandon us in our doubts and our skepticism. The problem is too many of us abandon God with our doubts and our skepticism. God does not abandon us in our doubts and our skepticism. But far too often, we abandon God with our doubts and our skepticism. You see, when I have doubts about something, and I say, hey, this doesn't quite fit, and I try to work it out and figure out what's going on, and I try to understand the depths of why I feel this incongruity, my faith grows, my life grows, I understand God better. I have a deeper appreciation of his love for me. I have a greater appreciation for the church. But when I simply hold on to doubt and skepticism so that I don't have to get involved, I don't have to, uh, to be more, more connected, I don't have to go deeper or do anything, all I do is waste away in lukewarmness. You know, sometimes you experience this. If, if, if this is too philosophical and theological for you, just think about your relationships. It's a lot more work to work out differences with your spouse. And sometimes your spouse is going to do something that you don't quite understand and doesn't make sense to you. But it's through talking to your spouse, working through those differences, you learn to appreciate things about your spouse that you might not have understood before. And then in working through those disagreements, you understand about a bond that is bigger than those differences. And you learn to appreciate something about your spouse. And you learn about a love that will, take, uh, uh, will accept you in your differences. And you understand something about your partner that you would never have if you didn't deal with the thing that bothers you, that uncertainty and the, uh, and the questions and the, and, the, and the things that cause friction. And so often in our faith, all we do is say, I'm not so sure about that, God. And all we do is just let that be our thing. And that becomes our answer for everything. I can't do that because I'm not sure about my faith. I'm not sure I can do that because I don't know if I believe in God. I'm not sure because of this. And all we do is use doubt and skepticism to deflect greater involvement. All the while, God is saying, hey, that doubt is meant to dig you deeper. That skepticism is meant to call you into a deeper faith and greater relationship. Answer the question. Don't just let doubt keep you away from God when it's the tool that's meant to connect you with God. And so when we think about doubt and we think about skepticism and we think about the different ways we experience doubt and the different ways we experience um, hope in doubt, may we remember that doubt and skepticism are God's gifts to us. They protect us from believing things that are untrue. They protect us from wolves when we follow a shepherd. They're meant to help us dive deeper and so that we may know God better, understand his will better, and go deeper into faith. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we talked briefly about doubt. And it's so hard, Father, because doubt sometimes is something we want to run from. We think it's just bad. We're afraid of doubt causing us to lose faith. And all the while, Father, you call us to keep asking the questions. You call us to think deeper, to emote more, to live so that both heart, mind, and soul would be gathered under your care. And so, Father, this morning, I ask that you would stir in our hearts. Help us to question our experiences. Help us to question the things we read. Help us to question the things we hear. Help us to allow those questions to lead us to greater truth and to a knowledge of who you are. 
in the face of a desire, Lord, to hear and read and experience only what we want. Disillusion us. Break those illusions, God, and help us to see what really is. And in the process, help us to find a deeper beauty than we could ever imagine. Father, we can't do this on our own. We can't do this by just reading the Bible. We can't do this by just sitting at home and and asking for the work of the Spirit. We need uh, your church and your people. We need the word to be shared, and we need the Spirit to stir in and around us. And so, Father, this morning, I pray for those in this church who have for too long allowed doubt and skepticism to keep them from being uh, better followers of you, that you would somehow uh, this morning uh, bring a change, allow that doubt to lead to something better. God, for those of us who have uh, refused to acknowledge doubt because we don't want to explore things that are uncomfortable, remind us that you're the God who will be with us through that journey and that we walk together to see you more clearly and help us, Father, to more faithfully follow you in all that we do. We pray this, O Lord, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.